Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Office on Violence Against Women Fiscal Year 2021 Transitional Housing Assistance Grants for Victims of Sexual Assault, Domestic Violence, and Stalking Solicitation Pre-Application Information Session. Um, on behalf of the Office on Violence Against Women, uh, the Transitional Housing Unit welcomes you to this call. And the trans Transitional Housing Unit consists of our supervisor, Michelle Brickley, who unfortunately is unable to join us today as she's attending new grantee orientation for other programs that she also manages. On the call, we have Mirta Charles, Charlene, Charlena Brady, myself, Sharon Elliott, and Dana Marshall is also a part of the, a member of the Transitional Housing Unit, but she is currently deployed. So with that, I will hand it off to Mirta Charles, who will begin our discussion um, talking about our program with a program description. Thank you, Sharon. This is Mirta Charles. I'm happy to join you today. We're going to talk about the Transitional Housing Assistance Grants for Victims of Domestic Violence, Dating Violence, Stalking, or Sexual Assault Program. This program funds organizations to assist victims of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking who are in need of transitional housing, short-term housing assistance, and related supportive services. To note, eligible applicants for this program are states, units of local government, Indian tribes, and other organizations with a documented history of effective work concerning sexual assault, domestic violence, dating, violence, and stalking. We will discuss each of these entities a little more in detail as we go on. Please note that the Transitional Housing Assistance Program supports supports projects that provide six to 24 months of transitional housing which support services for victims to do this simultaneously. These are victims who are homeless or in need of transitional housing as a result of a situation of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. It doesn't have to be all four, it can be just one. And with whom emergency shelter services or crisis intervention services are unavailable or insufficient. Please note the term homeless means an individual who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, who includes an individual who is sharing the housing of other persons due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or similar reason. It can be an individual who is living in a motel, a hotel, a trailer park, a campground, due to lack of alternative adequate accommodations, are also considered homeless. Persons living in emergency or transitional shelter are also examples of homelessness. Abandoned in individuals in a hospital or awaiting foster care placement are also considered homeless. Uh, an individual whose primary nighttime residence that is a public or private place not designed for ordinary or ordinary use as a regular sleeping accommodation for human beings or migratory children who qualifies homeless because children are living in circumstances described in this paragraph are also considered homeless. This language can be found on page five of the FY21 solicitation. We're going to discuss the purpose areas versus the prior, priority areas, priority, sorry, areas. These purpose areas are those indicated as part of the OVW transitional housing program. OVW priority areas are those receiving office-wide priority for this year's solicitation. Please note that these change usually every year, so they're different from perhaps previous applications that you've made or they're new to you um, as a whole. Let's discuss the purpose areas. Funds under this program must be used for one or more of the following purposes. And I will say must be used for at least two at minimum two of these part of these pur purpose areas. Transitional housing, including funding for operating expenses of newly developed or existing transitional housing is purpose area one. Short-term housing assistance, including rental 
or utility payments assistance and assistance with related expenses such as payment of security deposits and other costs incidental to relocation to transitional housing is purpose area two. And purpose area three, which provides comprehensive voluntary support services designed for survivors fleeing a situation of sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and or stalking and helps victims transition into permanent affordable housing. Those are the three purpose areas associated with this program. Please note, these are the only purposes this grant may be used for. For the purpose of the Office on Violence Against Women, transitional housing is a voluntary service that is designed for survivors offered for at least six months and no more than 24 months. Transitional housing can be provided in facilities that are owned by the applicant and units that are leased by the applicant or by providing rental assistance for units leased directly to victims. Support services offered to help transitional housing participants locate and secure permanent housing should be helped to secure employment and to integrate into a community. Examples of support services include employment counseling, occupational training, transportation, counseling, child care services, safety planning, case management, and other assistance. Please note support services must be offered to all transitional housing participants on a voluntary basis. OVW transitional housing projects cannot mandate that participants, that recipients participate in support services as a condition of receiving housing. This illustration uses the term transitional housing to refer to both transitional housing assistance and short-term assistance, which are defined as follows. Transitional housing assistance is temporary housing offered for at least six months, no more than 24 months, that helps victims transition into permanent housing. Transitional housing is not an extended shelter stay and does not support hotel or motel stays. Now, short-term housing assistance is rental assistance and or financial assistance, for example, security deposits, utility assistance, relocation costs, offered for at least six months and no more than 24 months that helps the victims transition into permanent housing. Short-term housing assistance is not emergency shelter, is not rental assistance that is offered for less than six months, or financial assistance for victims not provided with transitional housing. Applicants must provide both transitional housing, purpose area one or and two, and support services and purpose area three. If an applicant proposed to use transitional housing program grant funds to support only transitional housing or only support services, a project partner or another funding source must sustain the remaining components of the entire 36 month project period. This language is found on page six of the FY21 solicitation. Let's go through OVW priority areas. We have three this year. These priority areas are as follows. Empower victims to become survivors, survivors by focusing on long-term safety and sustainable economic independence. Increase the response to victims of human trafficking or primarily serve underserved populations. Let's go into a little bit more detail about these. Priority area. Let's look at OVW priority area one. Empower victims to become survivors by focusing on long-term safety and sustainable economic independence. Now, successful applicants for this priority may be eligible for an additional 24 months of non-competitive funding. Applicants should submit budgets for up to 500,000 for a 36 month period. You can look at this on award periods and amounts on page 11 of the FY 2021 solicitation. Please note, we'll discuss this a little bit later on, um, awards not, re, not addressing priority areas are between $300,000 to $450,000 budget. Now, applicants addressing this priority must clearly describe project partners who have expertise in workforce development and job placement in service area. They should provide a detailed plan for assisting survivors. They should uh, have trauma-informed victim-centered policies and practices to assist 
survivors with completing their education, obtaining employment, and have a comprehensive plan reflecting formal partnerships with organizations that have particular expertise in support services designed to enable survivors to secure employment, including em in obtaining employment counseling. There are further details for this priority area, but if you're looking to address this, this will be a priority area number one. Priority area number two is an increase the response to victims of human trafficking. Applicants proposing to address this priority are to describe the details in the gaps of current services for victims of sex, sex trafficking and how these victims are currently underserved. They should be able to describe the barriers victims of sex trafficking experience while attempting to seek services, as well as describe expertise and documented history of key project staff in providing services to victims of sex trafficking. We'll ask for a detailed plan of how this project will provide transitional housing to these victims. Applicants here should also submit budgets for up to 500,000 for a 36 month project period. Our last priority area is priority area number three, to primarily serve underserved populations. Applicants proposing to address this priority must, again, provide a detailed plan on how the project will provide specific services to un identified underserved populations. These populations can be based on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, geographic location, age, etc. They have to describe in detail the gaps in the current services and how these victims are currently underserved. They should describe barriers for these victims seeking services and demonstrate strong partnerships with project partners that have expertise and documented history to provide services to these underserved communities identified in the application. The term underserved populations, to be clear, means populations who face barriers in accessing or using uh, victim services and includes populations underserved because of geographic location, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, underserved racial or ethnic populations, populations underserved because of special needs such as language barriers, disabilities, alienate, alienation status, or age. This status allows applicants to submit budgets for up to 500000 for a 36-month period. You can find this information on page 11 of the 21 solicitation. I'm going to hand this off to my colleague, Charlena, and we're going to talk about prohibited activities and limits to funding. Charlena. Thank you. I will be reviewing with you the activities that compromise victim safety, out of scope activities, unallowable activities, and the limited use of funds. So for activities that compromise victim safety, the list of activities that compromise victim safety identified here can also be found on page eight of the solicitation. OVW does not fund activities that jeopardize victim safety, deter or prevent physical or emotional healing for victims, or allow offenders to escape responsibility for their actions. Applications that propose any such activities may receive a deduction in points during the review process or may be eliminated from consideration. Information on activities that compromise victim safety and recovery or undermine offender accountability may be found in the solicitation companion guide. Next, out of scope activities. Out of scope activities include research projects, prevention activities, family violence, housing retention, and emergency shelter or short-term short housing. These activities are deemed out of the program scope and will not be supported by this program's funding. More information and details about out-of-scope activities can be found on page eight of the solicitation. Next, we will review the unallowable activities. The following activities are unallowable under this grant program. Lobbying, fundraising, purchase of real property, physical modifications to buildings, including minor renovations such as painting or carpeting, 
construction, payment of mortgage, property taxes, or other expenses that would prevent foreclosure or eviction, payment of bills and utilities and arrears, drug and or alcohol testing, and using federal funds for saving accounts for survivors. Applications that propose activities that are out of scope, unallowable, or pose a threat to victim safety may have points deducted or removed from consideration altogether. This language is found on page eight of the fiscal year 21 solicitation. Also, please see a list of unallowable costs in the funding restrictions section located on page 24 of the solicitation. Next is the limited use of funds. The following activities can be supported, but only in limited circumstances. Legal services, purchase and or lease of vehicles, and services for children. For more information and details on the limited use of funds, please see page nine of the solicitation. Next, Sharon will go over the federal award information for you. Hi, concerning the federal award information, the grant award period is for 36 months, and that begins on October 1st of 2021. Awards will be made for up to $500,000. New and continuation grantees are eligible to apply with the following exceptions. Grant recipients that received an, uh, uh, received an FY 2019 or FY 2020 award are not eligible to apply as the lead applicant or as an MOU partner in the FY 2021 proposal. Likewise, an organization that is an MOU partner on an FY 2019 or FY 2020 award is not eligible to apply as the lead applicant or as an MOU partner on an FY 2021 proposal. And all of this information is available in the solicitation. We just highlighted here um, for emphasis and really to encourage you to refer to the um, solicitation as well. Current grantees um, with a substantial amount of unobligated funds that remain, uh, 50, which is 50% or more of your previous award as of March 31st, 2021, without adequate justification may not be considered for funding or may receive a reduced award amount if selected for funding in FY 2021. Let me repeat that. Current grantees with a substantial amount of unobligated funds remaining at 50% or more of their previous award as of March 31st of 2021 without an adequate justification may not be considered for funding or may receive a reduced award if selected for funding for FY 2021. So let me encourage you before you begin your application, um, check and see what your unobligated funds may look like um, planning out to that March 31st date. If it's less than 50%, you can proceed. I would encourage you to proceed with your, with your FY 2021 proposal. If it's more than 50%, you may want to reconsider applying for funding at this time. Um, so here we have some discussion about mandatory program requirements. Uh, mandatory program requirements are described on page 12 of the solicitation, so I'll just highlight them here uh, for emphasis. Mandatory program requirements uh, consist of participants attending OBW sponsored training and TA events. Um, recipients may be expected to dedicate some OBW funded time and resources to participating in an assessment or evaluation. You must submit the policies and procedures and rules govern, govern, governing, excuse me, the provision of the transitional housing and related support services for review. And this happens after 
um, after you have been notified that you received your award and after you've attended new grantee orientation. Those policies and procedures are then due um, 60 days after you've attended new grantee orientation. So that's what we mean when we say post-award. Um, another mandatory program requirement is that uh, you offer transitional housing and support services for at least six months, but no more than 24 months. We can't emphasize that enough. And you'll hear that over and over um, throughout this uh, presentation. You can only offer support services to individuals who are receiving transitional housing other than uh, the follow-up services that are, are described in my next statement. So you have to provide support services and transitional housing with this one little exception. You offer those follow-up support services for transitional housing clients who, secure, who have secured permanent housing. Follow-up services are limited to advocacy, support groups, case management, and minimal financial assistance, such as security deposits or first month's rent for permanent housing. And follow-up services must be provided for at least three months, but not more than 12 months. So there is a clear distinction between the um, support services that you provide clients who are in transitional housing compared to the services that are provided to um, clients that are in permanent housing. Those things, those services look very different. Um, let's move on to more program, uh, mandatory program requirements. Um, as you, as you um, draft your, your um, project proposal, I want you to remember that you must significantly involve a victim services provider in the implementation of the project, including the development and review of all policies and procedures and the provision of support services. So you must involve your victim service provider. Ensure that any staff, partner staff, or service providers work with transitional housing clients are trained to work with victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, or stalking. So it's not, everyone involved in the project should have um, that demonstrated work of, of providing services to um, survivors of one of those four vowel crimes. You, as a, as a mandatory program requirement, you must send the project coordinator and one other key staff member to an in-person OBW grantee orientation. And we know that we are currently working in a uh, primarily virtual, virtual, excuse me, environment. So should that change um, and those meetings are in-person, of course, you would accommodate the in-person uh, meeting. But if not, uh, and you'll be notified of this at, at the appropriate time, if it's virtual, we'll, we'll ma manage those meetings virtual. Uh, virtually, excuse me. Um, send key staff to an in-person OBW sponsored training or voluntary service. Agree to provide transitional housing to clients without requiring participation in support services. We can't emphasize that enough either. Um, these transitional housing services are to be provided without mandating that clients um, participate in support services. So that kind of drives home the point of programs really being thoughtful in the support services that they will provide. Are those, will those services be utilized? Are those the services that, um, that your grantees, not your grantees, excuse me, that survivors in your program are asking for? They've expressed an interest um, through your needs assessment. You've made the determination that uh, these particular services uh, will benefit and will be useful to um, survivors in your program. Notify OBW of any changes to the source of funding used to provide OBW grant funded transitional housing and or support services. So if you're uh, using 
some other source, say, for example, you apply um, to, to this program to provide housing and you're using another source for support services, if there's a change in that dynamic, you would let your program manager know that. Um, the a other mandatory program requirement is that you compensate at least one, if not all, of your project partners for time and travel to participate in project development, training, and implementation. And this really speaks to um, how you approach your uh, memorandum of understanding with your project partners. You have to compensate one, if not all of them. However, if that partner is a state or unit of local government and the partnership duties are conducted within the course of that agency's regular scope of work, you are not, there's no need to compensate that particular partner, but you also need to provide that explanation um, in the application. Okay, and so here, um, the, the next discussion brings us to uh, some of the, the requirements that are needed for our Grants Financial Management Division. Uh, we also refer to them as GFMD. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to focus on aspects of your application that relate to the documents that GFMD reviews. More specifically, we'll discuss some items that GFMD have identified from prior year applications that could help with expediting their review process. So for today, we're going to highlight certain aspects of the data requested with application and the pre-award risk assessment and provide you a link to a detailed webinar on how to develop the budget that will be included in your application. The first thing that I'll highlight are the items identified and the data requested with application, which is completed by all applicants. So whether you are a new applicant or a continuation applicant, you will you will you are required to uh, submit that data requested with application information. Specifically, two items we would like to discuss are the single audit response and the IRS three-step harbor procedure. OVW requests that all applicants provide a statement as to whether they have expended $750,000 or more in federal funds during their last fiscal year. If they have, then they indicate that and also specify the end date of their last fiscal year. However, GFMD is finding that applicants do not always include this information and leave out whether or not they have met the threshold or the end date of the last fiscal year is not included. Please ensure that this question is answered in its entirety on the data requested with application, which is question number three. So another item we'd like to highlight um, from the solicitation is specifically for nonprofit organizations. If you use the IRS three-step safe harbor procedure to determine your executive's compensation, you must reference the additional information section that provides the required disclosure letter. We'd like to highlight that there are four parts of this disclosure letter that must be provided to OVW in order to comply with this requirement. The sample letter that outlines all four parts of the disclosure, so please be sure to follow the sample and provide a response to each of the four pieces, which is question number six. The next item we'd like to discuss are the pre-award risk assessment, which assists GFMD during their pre-award risk assessment review for all applications. Each applicant must prepare a response to all 11 questions, and each question has multiple parts. This is very important to recognize. There are 11 questions, and each question has multiple parts. So be sure that you give it the attention that is required and you answer each question 
completely. We've noticed from prior years that applicants do not always fully answer all parts of the questions, which in turn requires GFMD to reach out to the applicant, which may delay recommendations. Some of the most common issues that we've encountered have been, for example, question number two, where the applicant indicates that they do not indeed have internal policies, but they don't provide a brief list. I'm sorry, that they do indeed have internal policies, but they don't provide a brief list of topics covered in the policies and procedures. Another example of incomplete responses include number three, where the applicant does not provide a brief summary of the organization's process for tracking expenditures, and more specifically, whether or not it tracks budgeted versus actual expenses, expenditures. So these are just a few examples, but basically, please make sure you read each piece of each question and provide a full and comprehensive response. And just a second, I wanna move along too quickly, just a moment, please. Okay, here we are with the resources that will, that will help you in creating your budget. So this slide will quickly highlight some resources that are available that should be used as you're creating the budget to be submitted with the application. Um, over the last year, GFMD has worked to develop a detailed webinar presentation on how to assist applicants in developing a budget to be submitted with their OBW applications. They want to help reduce any challenges you may face with the budget and make it clear what they look like for when they review your budget. This webinar provides some insight as to what OBW financial staff considers during their review. We will provide, the link is in the resources and the webinar can be found under the budget information section um, of the uh, solicitation. Next up is the uniform guidance, which can be found at CFR 200. Then another resource is the DOJ financial guide, as well as the program specific uh, solicitation. If you need assistance finding these resources, please contact the GFMD help desk. And you may reach the, the uh, GFMD help desk at 1-888-514-8556. And that information is also available um, on our website, I do believe. So here we are at, we'll move on and talk about eligibility information. So um, you want to make sure that you are an eligible applicant as you, um, consider applying for this, for this funding. Eligible entities are states, units of local government, Indian tribal governments or tribal organizations, other organizations, including sexual assault and domestic violence victim service providers, sexual assault and domestic violence coalitions, other nonprofit, non-governmental organizations, or community-based and culturally specific organizations that have a documented history of effective work concerning sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, or stalking. Qualified applications. To be qualified for funding under this program, applications must meet the following statutory definition of qualified application. An application is deemed qualified if it has been submitted by an eligible applicant, does not propose any activities that compromise victim safety. And we talked about the victim safety, um, uh, activities that compromise victim safety earlier. So refer back to the solicitation for that listing. Um, further qualifications for a qualified application 
um, your, you would reflect an understanding of the dynamics of the vowel crimes. When I say vowel crimes, I mean sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. And your proposal would not propose prohibited activities, including mandatory services for victims, which we've also covered that in our earlier discussion. So I will hand, hand this uh, discussion off to my colleague, Mirta Charles, um, to give you more information about other program eligibility requirements. Thank you, Sharon. Let's continue with other program eligibility requirements. We'll discuss required partnerships, role of victim service provider, transitional housing and support services, length of stay, support services for transitional housing participants only, follow-up services, and voluntary services. Let's start with required partnerships. The required partnerships described here should also be demonstrated in the applicant's memorandum of understanding referred to as the MOU, and this also should appear in the letter of experience, the LOE, that is part of your application submission. One, if an applicant is a victim service provider, you'll find the role of victim service provider outlined in the application. The application must include at least one other organization. For example, a housing provider, a local homelessness coalition, or other social service providers serving low-income households, including community colleges, workforce centers, community action agencies, and public assistance department, as a required partner identified in the MOU. If an applicant is a tribe, state, or unit of local government, the applicant must include both a victim service provider and a housing provider as required partners and may include other types of partners listed above. And again, identify in the MOU. Please be clear, if the applicant is a tribe, state, or unit of local government, it must have two required partners, a victim service provider and a housing provider. And lastly, if an applicant is an organization, including a domestic violence or sexual assault coalition, other nonprofit, non-governmental organizations, or community-based and culturally specific organization that has a documented history of effective work concerning domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, the applicant must include at least one other organization. For example, as we discussed before, a housing provider, a local homelessness coalition, or other social service providers serving low-income households, including community colleges, workforce centers, community action agencies, public assistance department, as a required partner identified in the MOU. To be clear, these are required partnerships. If you find that you are an entity that has, um, let's say you're a victim service provider and you have a community college that you're working with or you're part of, that does not preclude you from having another partner. These are partnerships. So while your entity may have the ability to do more than one of these services, we're looking for partners. Let me discuss the victim service provider. The full description of the victim service, victim service provider is found on page 15 of the FY 2021 solicitation. A victim service provider is a nonprofit, non-governmental, or tribal organization or a crisis center, including a state, tribal, domestic violence, and or sexual assault coalition that assists advocates for domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, including a domestic violence shelter or faith-based organization or other organizations with a documented history of effective work concerning domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. Victim service providers must provide direct services to victims of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking as one of their primary purposes and have a demonstrated history of effective work in the field. Victim service providers must play an active role in the development and implementation of the project. Again, as we said, an application from a tribe, a state, or local government must demonstrate that a victim service provider 
is significantly involved with the project design, development, and reviews all the policy and procedures described, describing how the applicant will ensure that everyone and anyone working with the transitional housing survivors is trained in working with domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. All applicants must identify their respective partnerships throughout the application narrative, as well as clearly and formally as evidence through the Memorandum of Understanding, known as the MOU, um, and the LOE. Please note that the um, information regarding the MOU will discuss later in detail, but that's found on page 30 of the FY 2021 solicitation. To emphasize transitional housing and support services. In this project, these must be offered to be a client they must be offered simultaneously to each client that is designated as a recipient of the OBW grant funds. So transitional housing and support services go hand in hand. Grant recipients must provide both. They fall under, again, purpose areas one and or two and support services, purpose area three. OVW funds can be used to provide transitional housing, support services, or both. In this instance, if OVW funds are found to be used to provide either transitional housing or support services, then you must find a project partner or another funding source to support the other element. The applicant must include this information on the data requested with application and making clear what funding source is supporting the housing and support services throughout the project period. We discussed the length of stay at length, um, but just to emphasize, again, one more time, your project will be centered around offering at least six months, but no more than 24 months of voluntary support services. At times, Victims may request a waiver for up to additional six months if the victim has made a good faith effort to acquire permanent housing, but not has been but has not been able to do so. However, you must note that this is not a factor of your application. It is when your project is being implemented. This is very much a exception to the rule and not the norm. So that waivers are granted through the agency. Uh, through OVW for clients that can demonstrate a good faith effort over a two-year period. Please note, this is not a shelter. This is not extended shelter. This is not rapid rehousing. This is not financial assistance, assistance for just a few months or permanent subsidized housing. It is transitional housing, again, defined by OVW as housing that is offered for at least six months and no more than 24 months to survivors as a bridge between emergency phase and permanent housing. These support services that are offered should be offered only to individuals residing in transitional housing. Again, let me emphasize, housing and support services should go simultaneously to transitional housing participants. It is not to be offered to uh, some another client that may have housing but would like support services or someone who has support services and would like housing. These two should be offered together simultaneously only to those receiving or being supported by OVW grant funds. My colleague Sharon had discussed with you at detail follow-up services, noting that follow-up services are for a minimum of three months and no more than 12 months. There should be a definite, definitive ending period for each transitional housing client who has secured permanent housing. Again, follow-up services should be limited to advocacy, uh, support groups, case management, a minimal financial assistance, like one month of security deposit uh, for rent into permanent housing. Let me emphasize voluntary services, all services, support services and follow-up services provided to recipients of transitional housing, either while in transitional housing or establishing permanent housing, must be voluntary. 
mandatory participation in services by survivors and also for shall be voluntary. It cannot be a condition for receiving transitional housing. So you can ask, well, if you want housing, I'd like you to go to counseling or I'd like you to turn, uh, attend a support group. That is not allowed. An application proposing a project that requires participation in any support services, including case management, will not be considered a qualified application. Okay, great. Next, we will review the application and submission information. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we will discuss the formatting and technical requirements, the application contents, which includes the data requested with application, the proposal abstract, which is a total of five points, the project narrative is 60 points total, the budget detail worksheet and narrative is 10 points total, the Memorandum of Understanding, also known as the MOU, is worth 15 points total. And the Letter of Experience, also known as the LOE, is worth 10 points total. We will review additional required information that will need to be submitted with your application, as well as the submission and deadline information. I would like to note that for fiscal year 21, applications for this program will be submitted through a new two-step process. First is the submission of the SF-424 and the SF-LLL in grants.gov. And the second submission will include the submission of the full application to include the attachments in the Justice Grants Management System, also known as Just Grants. All of this information will be discussed further in detail um, later in the presentation. Next. I will discuss the formatting and technical requirements. Applications must follow the following formatting and technical requirements outlined on page 10 of the solicitation. Proposal narratives must be double spaced, eight and a half by 11 inch paper, one inch margins, type no smaller than 12 point, times new Roman or aerial font, except for footnotes, which may be in 10 point font. Please include page numbers, headings, and subheadings that correspond to the sections identified in this section of the solicitation. Word documents will be accepted in the following formats, Microsoft Word, PDF files, or text documents. And lastly, no more than 25 pages for the proposal narrative. Sharon will now review the application contents with you in detail. Thank you, Charlene. Um, for the application contents, uh, as mentioned earlier, new for FY 2021, applicants will submit two parts, uh, the SF forms into grants.gov and the full application, including attachments into just grants. The application must include the proposal narrative, which will be uploaded as an attachment. The budget detail worksheet and narrative, that is a web-based form. The data requested with application, those responses to posed questions will be uploaded as an attachment. The memorandum of understanding, also known as the MOU, will be uploaded as an attachment. And the letter of experience will also be uploaded as an attachment. The data requested with application. Please include all required information as there are 13 elements um, to that particular, uh, in response to that particular uh, requirement. So make sure that you answer all of them fully and comprehensively. The data requested with application should be one to four pages and may be single or, dou or double space. The abstract, the abstract is worth five points and that will be entered in a text box in just grants. Um, the uh, proposal abstract must provide a short summary of no more than two pages double spaced of your proposed project, including the name, name names of the 
the applicant, the partners, the project title, um, the purpose of the project, the primary activities, who will benefit, the geographic area to be served, any products or deliverables, and how the applicant, how you, will measure your progress in completing your project goals and objectives. You should see page 18 in the solicitation for the abstract template, which makes it very easy for you to plug in the information that I have uh, mentioned here, and you'll see the full template when you, uh, when, when you visit page 18 in the solicitation. It's very, very easy to follow. The project narrative is worth 60 points in total. Uh, the project narrative includes the purpose of the application, what will be done, who will implement. Um, you'll, this is where you'll talk about the um, uh, office-wide priorities that you will address, uh, choosing one or all three, th those, um, those Priorities repeated here are the, the first one is to empower victims to become survivors by focusing on long-term safety and sustainable economic independence, the increase to response to human trafficking, and to primarily serve underserved populations. Those are the priority areas, and in the project narrative is where you would really flush out how you will address one, if any, any or all, I'm sorry, not any or all, but, but your choice of, of those uh, priorities. Uh, as mentioned before, there's a 25 page limit for the project narrative unless you are addressing a priority area. And so for each of those priority areas, you can add an additional page. So say, for example, you decide you want to address all three. So now your page limit is 28. The project abstract and data requested with the application are not a part of the 25 page limit for the project narrative. So keep that in mind. And, and really, let me emphasize um, that if you submit any more than, let's say, the 25, of course, is the limit for the project narrative unless you are addressing a priority area. But let's just say you decide you want to uh, address all three uh, priority areas, and so you're up to 28 pages, but you decide you want to really, really uh, tell us a lot about your project narrative beyond the allowance, the page allowances. We're not going to read beyond what we've indicated here. So also keep that in mind. So you, you really should concentrate on putting together a comprehensive narrative, project narrative, that uh, remains within the uh, those page limits. All right, here we'll talk about the budget detail workshop and not workshop, excuse me, worksheet and narrative. All applications must include a detailed budget and budget narrative. You should see the sample budget detail worksheet uh, that's in, and creating a budget webinar, which is available on the OBW website. You should really um, take a look at that because there's a lot of good information there that will help you in creating your budget detail and the, narr and, and the narrative that should accompany, accompany um, uh, that budget detail. Applicants proposing to use transitional housing program grant funds for housing alone or for both housing and support services may submit budgets for up to $450,000 for a 36-month period. Applicants proposing to use transitional housing program grant funds to support services only may submit budgets for up to $300,000 for a 36-month period. Applicants proposing to address the priority areas should submit budgets for up to $500,000 for a 36 month period. So just keep that in mind as you, um, you know, you start to create your program. If you are addressing the priority areas, um, if you're only providing housing and support services, or you, you're only proposing support services, there are different budget amounts for each of those options. So refer to the award period 
and amount section um, in the solicitation. And here's just a bit more on the budget detail worksheet and narrative. Um, the budget must, I'm sorry, the budget and budget narrative will be reviewed separately for the proposed project uh, narrative. So make sure that your narrative, your, your budget and your narrative are uh, comprehensive so that we can understand like what you are proposing and also being able to look at that budget and the narrative and determine how comprehensive it is as we look at that to make sure that you understand what you are proposing and that, that there's a clear picture for us as we review those, those budgets that we that we have a clear picture of your program and the associated uh, budget. The budget must display a clear link between the specific project activities and the proposed budget and include funds uh, in that budget to attend OBW, OBW, excuse me, sponsored technical assistance in the amount of $15,000 for applicants located in the 48 contiguous states and $20,000 for applicants located in the territories, Hawaii and Alaska. This amount is for the entire 36 month project period and not per year. Include a statement describing whether the housing units are applicant owned. You, that's information that you would include in your uh, budget detail and the narrative. Include as program income any fees charged to transitional housing participants if the transitional housing is applicant owned. Include funds or describe other resources available to support victims to ensure access for individuals with disabilities, um, deaf and hard of hearing individuals, and persons with limited English proficiency. There's a section um, in the solicitation, uh, accessibility, uh, entitled accessibility, which falls under the Federal Award Administration information. You see that section for more information but make sure you include those funds. We mentioned earlier as it pertains to MOU partners to compensate at least one, if not all of your project partners. Um, and as you do so, distinct, distinguish clearly between subawards and contracts um, and allocating any grant funds to other entities. So make sure that you read the solicitation and you, you, you read it with a fine tooth comb really so that you don't miss any of the points of the information that we are looking for when we review your application. This is a very competitive program so you want to make sure that you submit a comprehensive well thought out application. Okay let's Further, more information as it pertains to your budget. Um, hold on, I think I've. Okay, so no, we're going to move on to the um, MOU. I'm sorry. All applications, all applications must include a new MOU that is responsive to this solicitation and addresses all nine elements as described on pages 30 and 31 of the solicitation. And this is really a reminder for um, uh, our continuation applicants because sometimes what happens is that you, you, you resubmit an um, maybe a old MOU. So, you know, some of the partners may have changed in terms of names or is not currently dated. That MOU won't be accepted. So you want to make sure that your um, MOU is responsive to this solicitation, that the partners are current, that the titles are current, that the date is current. So revisit your MOU to make sure that that's the case. And for you new applicants, um, please make sure that you follow um, the, the guidance in the solicitation as it, as it uh, pertains to the MOU. Make sure that is currently signed and dated 
that that's uh it seems like a small thing but it's a big thing when you submit your mou and it's not signed or it's not dated your application can be um, removed from consideration so you need to make sure that um, that it's com that your mou is complete make sure that the purpose of the mou um, is demonstrated uh, the purpose of the mou is to allow applicants to to demonstrate that their proposed projects will be developed by a team of collaborative partners. So you want to be able to demonstrate that it was a joint effort between you and your partners um, and you all collaborated and this is the project that you're putting forth and this is the project that everyone will be involved in from beginning to end. And sometimes MOU partners change throughout the process, but for the purpose of this discussion, we want to see a collaborative effort um, or, or collaboration between the applicant and the, the, the uh, partners. Remember required partnership and the role of the victim service provider in the program eligibility requirements. The MOU should be very specific and mirror the project as described in the um, project narrative and budget. The MOU should be a single document signed and dated by the authorized rep of each agency. I can't emphasize that enough. The letter of experience, another important document um, to include in your application. All applicants must submit a signed and currently dated LOE, letter of experience, describing the applicant organization's documented history of effective work concerning domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. The LOE must be included as an attachment to the Just Grants application and address the following. Describe the applicant's organization of their history of work in serving survivors. Demonstrate a history of effective work excuse me, let me repeat that, demonstrate a history of effective work in serving survivors, describe the services to be provided, and describe the qualifications or skill of staff assigned to the grant and the training they have obtained, will obtain, and or provide or will be provided. So Make sure you look at that, L that the solicitation. Um, I will make note here that the LOE is limited to two pages. Thank you, Sharon. Let's start with submission and deadline information. All the information related to the submission requirements, dates, and times are on page 34 of the FY21 solicitation. Please note I will emphasize the matters that you should be that you should note in submitting the applications, but you can find reference and detailed information um, in the solicitation. Okay. After applicants obtain their DUNS number and register with SAM, they, begin, they can begin the grants.gov registration process. The applying organization must complete the grants.gov registration process prior to beginning an application for federal grant. <clears throat> Please note, you have used three systems at this point in order to submit your deadline information. That is the DUNS number, acquiring that, registering in SAM, and then beginning in grants.gov. The applying organization must complete the grants.gov registration process prior to beginning an application for a federal grant. <clears throat> the e-business point of contact, known as e-biz, POC, must register the applicant organization with grants.gov. The eBiz point of contact oversees the applicant's grant.gov transactions and assigns the authorized organization representative known as the AOR. <clears throat> the AOR submits the SF-424 and the SF-LLL to grants.gov and must register with grants.gov as well. So again, please note here, there are two points of contact that must help to register the application, which is the eBiz point of contact that oversees the applicant's grants.gov transaction 
as well as the signing and working with the authorized organization representative. In some cases, the eBiz point of contact is also the AOR for the applicant. So please note that that would make one person possibly responsible to do everything. Complete instructions can be found on the Grants.gov website. And I must note here, Grants.gov website is not controlled or has any authority by OVW. So Grants.gov is separate from OVW and we cannot respond to requests here. However, there's detailed information on the numbers and the hours and how to access that within the uh, FY 2021 solicitation. In Just Grants, which is our new application system, in Just Grants, each applying entity will have an assigned entity administrator who is responsible for managing ent entity level information and assigning roles in the system. Again, please note, Just Grants is a new grant management system used by OVW and other federal agencies. Just Grant system requires additional uh, roles, which is an assigned in entity administrator who is responsible for managing the entity level information and assigning roles in this new system. The entity administrator is also the eBiz point of contact that we were introduced to earlier, designated in SAMS.gov. Please see the Just Grants website for more information on registering with Just Grants. So please note, you will register again in at least three to four systems in order to apply for this award. It is the applicant's responsibility to ensure that the application is complete and submitted by the deadline. Failure to meet the submission deadline will result in application not being considered for funding. Applicants should refer the list below to ensure that all required steps and deadlines are met. Failure to begin registration or application submission by the deadline is stated in the list below that is not an acceptable reason for late submission. We'll go over that in the next slide. But please note that it's important to know what the guidelines are and how to meet them. So please read the application solicitation in its entirety so that you are familiar with these um, areas. This information is found on page 34 of the FY 2021 solicitation. One, attain a, num a DUNS number by March 2nd, 2021. Apply for a DUNS number, and there is a website that gives you what information that is and the number to call. Your second point is to register with SAM, as we discussed earlier, by March 2nd. 2021. You can access the SAM online registration through the SAM homepage and follow, and follow the online instructions for new SAM users. Please note that organizations shouldn't update their SAM registration at least once a year to maintain an active status. Number three, register with Grants.gov by March 2nd, 2021. So again, our process is DUNS number, acquire that. Register with SAM on March, by March 2nd. Register with Grants.gov by March 2nd. Again, by March 2nd. Once the SAM registration is active, the applicant will be able to complete the Grants.gov registration. So these must be done in a specific order in order to be able to move to the next step. Please follow this closely. Submit a letter of intent by March 2nd, 2021 to the OVW Transitional Housing email site. Please note that this, the letter of submission, or I'm sorry, the letter of intent does not indicate or is not mandatory for you to do so or indicate that you will uh, submit an application. It is just a letter of intent that you, if you wish to prepare and submit that you can and let us know that you intend or you might apply for an, app, for a, uh, an award. Number five. If necessary, request a hard copy submission by March 9th, 2021. Applicants that cannot submit an application electronically due to lack of internet access must contact the program or the program to request permission to submit a hard copy application. 
Again, if you find that you have difficulty or know that you can, it's not difficulty. If you know that you cannot submit an application electronically, then you must apply and request a hard copy submission by March 9th. Download an updated version of Adobe Acrobat at least 48 hours before GrantStack.gov deadline. So that would be February 28th. Applicants are responsible for ensuring that the most up-to-date version of Adobe Acrobat is installed on all computers that may be used to download the solicitation and submit an SF-424 and SFLL on Grants.gov. Please go to the Adobe Software Compatibility page to verify that an Adobe software version is compatible with Grants.gov. <clears throat> you will submit the SF-424, which is the title page SFLL in Grants.gov, as early as possible, but no later than 20 to 40 hour, 48 hours prior to the Grants.gov deadline. Again, reiterating that is March 2nd, 2021. You'll register the entity administrator and the application submitter with just grants as early as possible, but no later than 70, 48 to 72 hours before the, grants, the just grants deadline. Again, let me reiterate. Register the entity administrator and the application submitter with just grants as early as possible, but no later than 48 to 72 hours before the just grants deadline. That just grants deadline is March 16, 2021, 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Submit the complete application package at least 24 to 48 hours prior to the just grants deadline and then confirm an application receipt. So please submit your complete application 24 to 48 hours prior to March 16th, 2021, 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Submitting the application components at least 48 hours before each deadline, grants.gov or just grants as applicable will enable the applicant to receive notice of a failed submission and provide an opportunity to correct the error before the applicable deadline. <clears throat> now you will find detailed information on page 35 of the FY21 solicitation that details this information for you. For those of you with, those of you who are, who might experience technical issues with Just Grants, you should contact OVW Just Grant support line as soon as possible. Also, OVW will take the necessary steps to ensure that applicants are able to submit their applications on time. Applicants experiencing Just Grants technical issues should ensure that they are developing their proposals while they are working to address any issues. Applicants should follow the solicitation guidance regarding technical difficulties. This will enable them to submit a full proposal by the deadline using an alternate method if necessary. We will update our submission guidance as necessary and as the due date nears. So please, if you find that you have difficulty in submitting your application and you're going through the process, um, you know what the steps are, look for updates. I will reiterate that you can review the section for OPW policy on late submissions or other submission requirements on page 35. And there is also a section called Experiencing Technical Difficulties Beyond the Applicant's Reasonable Control, which is found on page 36 of the FY21 solicitation. This allows you to troubleshoot issues to provide the organization with the best possible outcome if it encounters any difficulties in submitting an application. Please read this section early and follow the guidelines if it becomes necessary. So you know what to do and you won't be surprised at the end if you're having difficulties. Having read it beforehand, when you come across a difficulty, you'll know that you have what steps to take, who you have to contact, what evidence or what documentation you need to have in hand to show that you are indeed meeting these necessary deadlines. I'd like to go over some of other um, tips besides the um, experiencing technical difficulties that will help your submission. Please review the application submission checklist on page 41 and 42 of the station to ensure 
at the beginning of creating the application and at the time of submission to be sure that all materials are turned in. So all the things we talked about are found in your application narrative and all of them are submitted together in your application. There's a checklist, use that. Read the solicitation in its entirety before applying. File the solicitation. The information in the application needs to be as detailed as possible. Now, I'd like to note that continuation applicants should write the application as if it's the first time that OVW has ever heard of their project. Often, uh, continuation applicants allude to something of their project or some of their achievements, but they don't write it out fully, assuming somewhere along the line that OVW will review that. Unfortunately, if OVW gets to a point where they would view their applicant, it might not be somebody that knows your program at all. And by the time they get to us, you might have already been eliminated. So please note, please write your achievements, your uh, what character or elements that really enhance your program fully so that those that read it, the peer reviewers, will, who have no knowledge of your program will be uh, impressed by what you have achieved. Ensure that each section is completely addressed, even if it feels redundant, just like we did today. I know you heard about length of stay a number of times, voluntary services. These are repeated because they're important. But just as you see that when you're writing your application, each section is looked at separately. Therefore, we need you to make sure that you respond to each criteria, each element in the section that is re requested of you. Number all pages. Limit the usage of acronyms included in the application. Often, because it's a nationwide, people have different acronyms for different things. And when we all receive it, people don't know which acronym or what that stands for because they might have a different understanding of that. So make sure that as best as you can, that you don't use acronyms except when absolutely necessary or it's a widely held acronym. Information submitted beyond what is required in solicitation is not likely to be read by OVW staff or peer reviewers. Sharon spoke of that earlier, so remember if you have 20 pages because you respond to priority areas and you decide to submit 31 pages and you're like crossing your fingers, don't bother. We won't be able to read it. It's a time crunch and we'll stop at 28 if necessary, but really go for 25 if you're not uh, responding to any of the priority areas. That is our limit. Please maintain that. The OVW website contains information on transitional housing models and rent structures. Please use this as a means of uh, familiarizing yourself with the terms that are used around transitional housing, um, being able to better articulate in less words how your housing is going to be structured. Um, this helps uh, in conveying information to uh, the peer reviewers and those who are reviewing your applications by using words that and terminology that is um, recognized. However, that's not uh, a mandatory or looking at, it's just another way of um, enhancing your application. Please utilize the FY 2021 solicitation companion guide. Um, you'll find that link throughout the application or solicitation. Um, a solicitation companion guide links up to other additional information that may provide more detail. Um, it links to what other federal uh, requirements there are. It gives additional information, a different examples that may be able to really enhance what your project will look like. So please uh, go to that when you're reading the solicitation in its entirety. Um, you'll find those links. Make sure you also uh, look at the solicitation companion guide. Uh, I just want to say, as we come to a close, this presentation does not supersede or negate any information provided in the written guidelines of the FY 2021 Transitional Housing Solicitation. So please refer to that if you have any doubts, any questions, or you're not sure what you heard, please go to the pages that we've referenced. Please read the application of the solicitation in its entirety in order to uh, elevate your application. Thank you again for your participation here today, and we look forward to receiving your application. On behalf of the Transitional Housing Team, good day.